You beat me again. How are you doing this, Putnam? Well, as promised, we've got the stream started up here. We're going to be going forth and, well, what are we going to be going forth and doing, Amanda? Do you know? I don't know. Doing deep sky object searching? Yeah. There's a few of them that we'll be able to check out tonight, I'm sure. We've seen a lot already, but I'm going to try and locate some other things we haven't spent too much time looking for. Um, and that'll be kind of cool. I have uh, obviously it's it's actually quite cold out tonight, <clears throat> so we have to keep it uh, trying to keep it in the region of well where we are right now in the sky, and uh, I may have to go move the dome so we can do some other stuff outside our area that we've been playing around in. This area that I'm in right here is a very interesting area. We've got a a little galaxy in here and I'm taking a 20 second shot at ISO 32,000. We just see a little galaxy right here uh, which is kind of cool that it's right there and I'll look at it here with you in just a minute uh, well actually in a few seconds and then we'll check it out. It's really pretty although it's very very small and there it is, right there, that little guy, right there. You say, well, what the heck is that doing there? That's nothing. Well, the fact is, it's actually a really interesting little galaxy. And let's, let's just get some processing on it a little bit, just to kind of show it up a little bit. And now you can see, uh, you know, we can zoom in a little, but you're not going to see too much. It's very, very small, very, very faint. Uh, and you'll notice there's a little structure to it, which we can see. Um, and you might ask, well, where is this galaxy? And the answer is rather interesting. It's right next to the Orion Nebula. The Orion Nebula is over here a little bit. So uh, if we were to uh, come out to our our wonderful little, uh, let me just bring us back to, oh, I don't want that. Uh, I had the wrong thing. Uh, <laughs> if we come back to our nice little, uh, our, our nice little, uh, view here. Let me just take us off the viewer and just go back to uh, here which is our nice little planetarium. Uh, you'll notice this is the galaxy right here and here's the Orion Nebula. Isn't that cool? <clears throat> now this little tiny galaxy cool. is uh, uh, a little object. There. It's it's, uh, it's actually a uh, uh, magnitude 13 galaxy which means it's actually quite faint. Uh, relative to everything else in this area. Uh, and uh, it's about uh, 153 uh, million light years away. So it's really far away. And that's 153 million light years compared to this, the Orion Nebula, which is only 1,300 light years away. I wish we could see it like on the same view, you know, but we can't, uh, sadly, you know. Uh, Vicky has a question. Sure. How much color can be seen in galaxies with a telescope in space? Actually, a very good question. It depends on on uh, the size of the galaxy and the quality of the camera. Our particular camera, we should be able to see colors in galaxies pretty readily. And I'm probably going to move the dome to show us a little bit of that. Earlier in the evening, I was able to show the uh, Andromeda galaxy pretty well. And it looked really nice, but uh, I'll give you an example. Actually, I'll show you. I just took a real quick shot of it you know, to see what it would look like. Uh, and uh, we caught, I'll show you here. Here's what I caught. I caught this in just a few seconds, and it was actually a bad photo. This one was a little better, I think. Um, and uh, it still had a little, you see a little bit of 
swooping going on here. This wasn't really the the best. And uh, the problem was that the Andromeda Galaxy was really um, it had the dome in the direction that it was facing. It was actually kind of windy, and the wind was coming into the dome. Uh, but if we actually uh, turn off and get some processing, you can see some really interesting details. This was just a 20-second photo of the Andromeda Galaxy, <clears throat> so it looked pretty good. You know, it looked really nice. Uh, I'm really pleased with that. It looks nice, but uh, I do want to, uh, I do want to make sure that we, you know, uh, I do want to make sure that we, you know show you things that you can we can readily see tonight uh, and we will we will do so um, we're only going to go until about midnight which is only about another hour and 15 minutes uh, but it, it's because I so just, he says now yeah no it's just that I, I, I we just did the two hour sky tour radio show uh, our first two hours ever and uh, it went pretty well I think uh, I think so we'll We'll certainly hear from people if they don't think it went well. Um, so I just want to uh, make sure that uh, people understand that we are no slouches when it comes to this. We are happy uh, to uh, show you things that we've never seen before. Uh, and we would like to, we'd love very much to actually show you things that we've never seen before. So <clears throat> that said... Can can we see Ultima Thule? No, actually, Ultima Thule is in the daytime sky. It's actually yeah. very near the sun. It's in. It, and it's not near the sun. The sun is in Sagittarius area, and Ultima Thule is also in that region. So it's in the daytime sky. It's on the other side of the sun, almost directly, actually, from us. <clears throat> so that's why we wouldn't be able to see it, unfortunately. Or I would have shown it to us already, but... It is kind of dim. It is kind of dim. I don't know if we could actually record it with just the regular exposures we do here, which is only as much as 30 seconds. Uh, so that's unfortunate. Um, but I want to try one thing actually while we're here. I'm going to take us uh, and take us go back to my nice little planetarium for a second. All right, and let's pull out and do a. A view, say, of uh, Al Natak. All right, let's go look at Al Natak. All right, and we're gonna just run over there now, really quick. And to run to Al Natak, we see that the stars are swinging around, and there's Al Natak right there, beautiful as it is. And you'll say, "Well, what are you doing at Al Natak?" And I'm gonna show you. Uh, at least I think I'm gonna show you. Let's just go quickly over here to see. Uh, I think I'll be able to show you. We have another really great question from Vicky. Awesome. Go for uh, it. She wants to know, are all bright objects we see stars like our sun, or are some planets showing reflectivity from their suns? Um, in our solar system, or when we're looking like at scenes like this in the sky? Yeah. When we're looking at scenes like this in the sky, we're seeing other stars. Uh, they're all stars. They're, we don't see planets ever when we're looking at a telescope here. Um, we can see planets in our solar system by aiming a telescope at planets, and then we can see the planets, and they are reflecting the light of our sun. They're not generating any light of their own. Is that... Maybe she means, like, mm -hmm. I thought she meant, like, exoplanets reflecting <clears throat> light from their sun. Yeah, well, that's that's... We we will we were able to see that, and when the James Webb Telescope goes up, um, we have a database of reflectance indices. They're called, and these reflectance indices are uh, taken of the Earth, courtesy of Carl Sagan back in the '90s, who, when the Galileo space probe was heading to Jupiter, said, "Hey, let's turn Galileo around and have it look at the Earth, so we can see what different types of vegetation look like from such an equipped space probe." And they actually went and went to uh, uh, did that. And when they did that, they actually discovered that uh, the uh, the the, uh, the Earth had different reflectance uh, based on what was reflecting the light. So in other words, they built a database. Sand looks a certain way. Reflectivity looks a certain way. Water looks a certain way. The rainforest looks a certain way. Vegetation of different types looks different. 
And they built this database. And when they did this, this opened up an entirely new capability for us. We can now go to an exoplanet and see an exoplanet and make sure that we can see the uh, make sure that we can actually see this these reflectance indices coming from it. And when we see the reflectance coming off of a planet around another star, based on the reflection, its reflectance, we can actually tell, we think, whether this planet has rainforest, sand, or what have you. We'll be able to tell what the planet actually has on its surface. I think that's pretty uh, exciting. That's probably one of the most exciting things we've, uh, we've heard to date, you know, that we can do. Um, <clears throat> I'm here for a reason. I'm going to try taking a 10-second, uh, maybe I can do a little more. 10, 13 seconds sounds good. Uh, at very, uh, let's, let's go down to uh, 3,200. 10 seconds at 3,200. Let's try uh, 13 seconds at 3,200. Let's do this. This is the spectral system that's going to record the spectra. And so that's what I want to... Uh, show right now so let's see if we can bring that in uh, this is this area you're seeing here are clouds from the last time okay uh, I tried it this, this was actually last time was being earlier tonight so there were clouds all throughout the sky earlier tonight so let's see what we get it's coming in now oh look at that now there is a very telling photo this is really interesting this is the spectrum of the Orion Nebula and the three stars in the belt. You see them? I do. Yeah, and let's just close in on this spectrum here a little bit. Uh, I want to show you something really interesting. Is the one at the bottom a sword? Yeah, this is this is the Orion Nebula's spectrum. Oh. The nebula. And you'll okay. notice something interesting about this spectrum. Remember we talk about the fact that when, and this is actually a very, very good teaching moment, guys. When we look at Orion's Nebula, we say and we talk about how the red areas are emission by hydrogen atoms, right? And that emission is actually a uh, product of the electrons being ionized and then recombining with the hydrogen atom, and they give off some light. Usually, when we look at objects that are like stars or whatever, the light they give off is actually light that is... Uh, this is a little bit out of focus. The, the, the light they gave off it was going to create dark lines, like we see dark lines here in some of the spectra. These are stellar spectra. But when we look at emission nebula, they're called emission nebula. Why? Because, look, amongst the areas that might have some dark lines, we see emission lines. This is a bright red line here. This is a bluish green line here. Isn't that interesting? So we're actually seeing the emission in operation of the emission nebula. Okay, whoops, that was bad. All right, so now uh, what this means is when we look at the stars, though, uh, when we look at the stars up close, we actually see, and this is actually a double star here. We're looking at Al Natak with its partner. Uh, and we can actually see that there's, uh, uh, you know, lines in the spectrum. They'd, they'd be a little clearer, and the lines are going to go this way. Okay. Uh, and if it's, so you can see some blue lines, some lines there in the blue. These stars are hot and they're blue, so that's why this blue is so bright. Okay, notice the red trails off. That's because they don't have a lot of red. This star actually has less red than these two stars, notice. So we're already telling something about the stars, and color means temperature in the astronomy world. Color means temperature. But in the spectra, we learn a whole bunch of things, and this is a... Uh, are a nice way to look at the spectra. When we look at the, uh, when we look at this star, for instance, we can actually see that there's some lines crossing in here. These lines are called absorption lines, and these are elements in the outer atmosphere of this particular star. Uh, in this particular case, right here, these dark lines are caused by the atoms in the outer atmosphere of the star absorbing some of the energy coming from the interior of the star, which is a lot hotter. And that energy absorption causes a, a dark line at a very characteristic place in the spectrum. You can see there's one here and there. And when I, uh, when I focus this better, we'll actually be able to see uh, this, this a lot better. 
In fact, uh, let's do this one more time, but I'm going to do another thing. I'm going to do this. I'm going to bring this up, all right, and I'm going to turn off the tracking. This is the drive that keeps the telescope following things. I want to turn it off, and by turning it off, when I take a photo this time, now, uh, during the time of the exposure for 13 seconds, the spectrum is going to kind of drag out this way as the stars actually can go this way as the stars migrate this way toward the west which is that way uh, it's going to create a, a a wider spectral pattern uh, which is easier to see what's going on so uh, we'll bring this back up and we are going to uh, shut or turn back on the tracking as soon as the picture comes in all right okay so we turn back on the tracking now Tracking is on, and now if we zoom in, uh, we can we see the band is wider now. Uh, and I, uh, like I said, I still got to focus it, uh, but when we focus it, it's going to look a lot better. It's going to have a lot more interesting stuff to see. Um, and I just like the fact that here's the belt stars right here, by the way. So here's the three stars in the belt. And then this is their spectra, okay? Not that, I, that you may not worry about this, but we when we capture the spectra, we want to capture the star and the spectrum. That way it why makes... Why is it so far away? Uh, why is it not zoomed in, you mean? No, I mean, why is the spectra so far from the star? Well, yeah, that's just because the, the I'm using what's called a diffraction grating to capture the spectra. And a diffraction grating is a piece of glass, a round piece of glass with... Thousands of lines, thousands of vertical lines, all running in one direction. And when you run light through that, it breaks it up into the spectrum. And depending on how close those lines are, you can get a different spectrum. This particular spectrum uh, means that when I take the spectrum, I can just zoom in on this and keep this if I want to, just this one piece of the, you know, of the spectrum of the star. And again, I'm shooting it at high ISO. Uh, and at high ISO, we like at 3200, we don't really get a, a very clear view. It's, it's going to have noise in it. And what's the noise? The noise is the stuff you see here. Okay. Um, and this noise has to go away. Uh, so we would actually shoot this uh, at a, at a uh, lower ISO, which I will do, you know, at some point. In fact, I can try it now. I can just say, go down to, say, uh, 200 and see if we actually capture the belt stars. And to do that, uh, I'll just go and see what I get. You know, and we'll do uh, 13 seconds. And while it's going, I'm going to uh, also shut off the tracking so that we'll see a bright edge where I didn't shut off the tracking. And then when it comes back, I'll turn back on the tracking. That's what's nice about this control system. I can actually shut off the telescope basically for a short amount of time. And it's still mathematically correct when it comes back on. Okay, so then when this comes back, okay, we come back up. And it is going to be fainter because I brought this down to 200 from 3200. But when we come in now, okay, we'll be able to see the spectra will be a little bit cleaner. You see that? There's not a lot of noise in there. Uh, I do have to still focus these because you can't really see the lines too well going across. Uh, but they're there. And when I focus the camera, we'll see. I wasn't intending on doing this tonight, but I figured since I'm here, I, I might as well try it, you know. And I uh, I have to focus that one manually, so uh, I'm not I'm not outside to do that, obviously. But anyway, I wanted to show you that the spectra is coming along, and we're going to be able to analyze stars and tell what they're made of uh, very, very soon. All right. So that's the next phase, the next thing we're going to be doing. Um and uh, if you haven't been to P&K Space Imaging, Paul and Keith now have this beautiful uh, image intensification system. Uh, is what it looks like to me. Uh, I got to get the lowdown from Paul and, and Keith to see if it's actually infrared, like they were saying. Um, uh, but it's cool. And, and they did some beta. Uh, they did some beta work uh, just recently, and boy, it looks really, really good. So let's go back to our. Uh, view that we like so much this is the one that uh, I like to use a lot and we'll also go to uh, here 
and see we're here and I had to put the telescope there because the star is here and its spectrum was up here remember so I have to kind of move the main telescope which is not connected it's connected to the spectral system because it's riding along on it uh, in fact uh, to see where that is we can just bring back our view here temporarily let's go uh, not that let's go to here all right and uh, let me get my let me get my cameras uh, back up and functional and see this is the barrel of the telescope uh, let me show you where that is okay uh, this is the barrel of the telescope right here do you see that that's the barrel of the telescope I and, see that, yeah. and this is the the camera's lens all right that's doing the spectral work looking out Okay, this is the spectral camera looking out. So we're actually kind of looking at the spectral camera right there. So it's looking out, and the main telescope, of course, is here. And it's looking out through the dome. Here's the dome slot. That's why it's dark, obviously, open. And we're looking at the bottom of the telescope right there as it's leaning back because it's a polar-mounted telescope uh, on a large steel pier. Uh, so that's neat. I like it, and it's uh, really got some cool... Uh, uh, you know, uh, system work we can do with it, and we're gonna play around with it. Now let's uh, let's see. Now I have to. We have some questions coming in. Cool, sure, bring them up. Um, okay. Well, there was one, but I lost it. I can't remember. Well, not that I lost. It. I remember the question, no. but I can't remember. I think it was. I think it was Dunster. Okay. Wanted to know about. Um, China landing on the far side of the moon. Oh, was that Chang Four? And Chang Four, I believe. <clears throat> and yeah. and just what exactly we hope to learn from it going there. Well, uh, Chang Four actually uh, is going where, and they like to say where no man has gone before. But the fact is, we have uh, the lunar reconnaissance orbiter has actually shown the far side of the moon uh, in in really complete detail. Uh, but let's be honest, landing on the far side of the moon is really a feat of engineering because we have always landed on the near side of the moon. And depending on what, where you are in the cycle, you could land day or night on either the f side facing us or the, uh, the side away from us. But it takes longer to orchestrate a landing on the far side. So the fact that they've done it is really quite a feat. And uh, I think it's it's kind of, you know, it, it's... It befits them. It, you know, it fits the fact that you know they they did their due diligence. You know, and uh, uh, but I think that it's actually a very interesting uh, mission. I don't necessarily think they can show us anything that's different, but we know from SkyTour livestream, we've talked about this. The far side of the moon's crust is thicker than the near side, and on the far side, there's no maria. There's no dark seas, so to speak. On that, on that far side. And the reason has to do with how infrared energy, when the Earth and Moon were, were semi-molten, uh, it has to do, wow, this is pretty, has to do with how the infrared e imagery, the infrared energy uh, was processed. And what happened was when the, when the Earth was molten and the Moon was getting hit by impacts, it was made molten here and there. Uh, and I'm going to move this over before I come back to it. And the bottom line was when, when it was uh, molten, they ended up uh, they were able they were able to uh, 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 the the objects that were thrown off from the moon into the area around the moon. That's called the exosphere because it doesn't have an atmosphere, so it's exosphere the area around the moon. When the the objects hit the moon, they'd throw this stuff up in the in the exosphere, and the infrared radiation coming from the Earth, which was substantial would push that material over to the other side of the moon. That's the theory that uh, is, is what people are, are talking about now as a possibility. <clears throat> and that actually uh, caused the far side of the moon to gradually become thicker with more sediments that landed on it from this process. Uh, that's a simplified view of what actually happened. But suffice it to say that the infrared energy from the Earth is theorized to have been the key to getting that material over to the other side. Naturally, it made a thicker 
crust over there. And that thicker crust, uh, you know, of course, ended up being a, uh, this is beautiful, ended up being a, uh, um, a crust that would not uh, allow um, Maria to form if something him impacted it. There's a lot of impacts on the far side. So that's pretty cool. Uh, this is actually Casper the Friendly Ghost Nebula. If you want to actually see it uh, by name, it's, uh, uh, let me just see the actual name. The actual name of it is NGC 2064. Uh, and it's a reflection nebula. And there's a lot of detail in it that uh, we will be able to capture. I actually did the Running Man, uh, and I processed the Running Man. Oh, man, it looked really pretty. And I think I'm going to uh, see if I can do this. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. This is a, I know it's black right now. This is a generic screen I have right now, uh, and I'm I'm gonna see if I can actually. Uh, I won't do it now because I don't I don't think I have the uh, uh, the everything defined correctly. But what I want to do is I want to show um, show the resulting photos of what we took earlier um, yesterday. Um, I'm trying to figure out how we can do that. Uh, we might be able to do that. Oh, I think I know. So I'm going to take another exposure here. While I'm doing that, I'll, I'm going to go digging for something that might help us. So we're going to take another shot of this Casper the Friendly Ghost uh, Nebula. And it's, it's really going to be pretty, I think. So uh, I want this this guy here. Nope, I didn't want to take that. Huh? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so while you're working on that, yeah. uh, Tim said... Is it wrong of me to hope every time I'm on here I see a UFO pass by in one of the streams? No, and, not at all. Uh, everyone kind of, I think, feels the same. Uh, but he wants to know, has it ever happened to you while stargazing or searching? I've seen some pretty odd things pass uh, in front of my telescope. Usually um, I'm doing all the work, you know, like myself, and, and I'll see things pass and no one's been able to see them with me. Like last night when we were streaming, uh, we saw that dashed line tumbling satellite rocket body that we saw, remember? And then we saw a satellite that we tracked moving through the field, if you remember that. Tumblers, yeah. Yeah. Well, guess what? We actually what? had two more go through that very same field uh, that we didn't see. And really? Yeah, absolutely. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, one down below, one up top. Oh, man, it was really cool. I thought it was really impressive, most impressive, you know. So that was. Neat. I'm gonna do that from now on. When pictures come in, I'm gonna uh, do a quick little scan to see if I see any streaky dotty lines. Oh, I, I bet you will, and that's gonna be cool. That will be cool. I'm gonna just drop to this view. I know it's black, but bear with me for one minute because I want to try and uh, capture uh, this particular window that we're looking at. And then when I bring it up, we'll be able to, I think we'll be able to actually see it just a second. And Martin also wants uh, to know if you could take a moment to describe your equipment. That's the scope, <laughs> mount, camera, <laughs> software, everything. All right, okay. I can do that. First Thank of you. all, um, what, we're, what we're looking at here is, um, let's go back to, uh, let me go back to my, main view here which will kind of tell us a little more okay all right in this view okay this is our main view and this controls a telescope the telescope i have is in a dome a physical dome and uh i can actually now that i have a image linked to it uh, i could probably go get photos to show you all these things um and the uh the dome is uh, uh an eight foot telescope dome and there is a 10-inch uh, telescope, uh, you know, catadaptric, you know, schmidt cassegrain in there. Mounted on there is a spectral system now. Uh, I can swap it out for a 5-inch refractor, Richfield refractor, to go along with the main scope. And we would actually uh, get to see some really interesting uh, stuff <clears throat> with that uh, telescope. It's just a really pretty combination. I've saw I've seen some really amazing things so far with this, and I'm uh, so that that's the two scopes I generally use. Um, the spectral system is a, a grading in front of another camera that's up there, 
and that's a wider angle because you don't need to be zoomed in to catch the spectra uh, like this. The, the spectra will show the lines very well. It depends on the resolution of the spectra uh, of the uh, grading that you're using. Um, so I'm broadcasting uh, live with a broadcast program and I'm using several cameras to do like down here in the corner and over here the dome ops uh, the dome cams you can actually see what's going on where it's pointing and go for a ride with the telescope as it moves around uh, it's just a neat uh, process so there's an awful lot of little pieces to to all this and uh, I think that uh, these pieces are, are uh, uh, they all go hand in hand you know so I hope that helps I don't know if you need to know any more uh, if you do, let me know. Helps. If you need, if you want to know more, let me know. I'll be happy to. I'll be happy to uh, tell you what's going on. All right. So now let's go back to here. Um, I'm going to uh, take another one because <clears throat> I'm going to do the process here to make this look really nice. I'm going to go over uh, to our generic full screen for a minute because I want to show you something. Uh, and we'll put this right here. I'm going to kind of go up here, drag it over, because I really want you to see something that I'm doing here. This is kind of cool. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, go and open some of the product or some of the stuff that we've actually did last night. Um, and I think that you'll appreciate this. So, uh, okay going to this machine going to this drive going to last night's session and the directory for that is where here and this is last night's session and let's bring up this guy first okay this is uh the first this, one someone said you were a little low your mic volume well i might be um, so hold on one second. Let's see if we can do this. Okay, okay there we go. Ooh. Ooh. And Daryl, I think, is still in chat. I hope he's still in chat. Well, actually, I hope he's asleep and resting well yeah. and getting over this bug he has. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah. I think if, yeah, oh, yeah, he's still here. What a trooper. Yeah. Look at this. Yeah, this is the running man that we let Daryl as, uh, as, uh, favorites, expected. did you say? What's that? I didn't know that. Yeah, this is the running man. Yeah, I know. Oh, okay. Sorry. Let me, uh, I uh, gotta do a couple of things. Let me just adjust this window anyway. Uh, does this help me? Is this where I'm going? Yeah, with a few people are saying that it's a little quiet. It, it, it might be because I'm turning away from the mic sometimes because I'm doing a few things at the same time. So I apologize for that. Uh, but let's see if I can just, uh, do this. Let's say, uh, move it. Yeah, you, you don't get too quiet because you're, uh, <laughs> you actually have, uh, a pretty loud voice. So you carry very, really well. Yes. Yes, you do. Yes, yes you do. do. She does. Okay. This well, I mean, I don't know. I'm pretty loud and clear. When yeah. I'm talking normally, yeah. but then when I get excited about an idea or something I see, I get really, really loud, and I don't mean to. Okay. So just keep that in mind. When people are cranking cranking the volume, trying to strain to hear Mark, just remember I'm on the line too, and <laughs> you never know when I might come in, blow yeah. your eardrums, blow the speakers. Yeah. Uh, well, let's see. I mean, I could... I could just raise the volume a tad. So this is actually, this is more like it was last night now. This is actually a little bit higher, and it'll bring you up too a little bit as well. Uh, so let me know. This is this is the Running Man Nebula. This was We, we took this uh, yesterday. You can see this beautiful detail. We never captured this kind of detail in the Running Man before uh, with Skytro Livestream and John Zach Memorial Observatory. We, we couldn't. We didn't capture this kind of detail. Notice it's a it's a partial reflection nebula, but you see a little bit of emission over here. This is that reddish area. 
this you can clearly see is obstructing the brighter nebula behind it and it's wispy you can see these little wisps okay and you can see how they just come up and 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 sort of protrude and occlude something in the background but look at this this is really beautiful and uh i spent about uh, 40 minutes today working on the running man to try and bring it up to uh, standards that I think are uh, good for you all to see. Um, and so the running man is beautiful. And what I want to do is I want to show you um, the other photos that we took the other day that uh, might also intrigue you. Uh, and I'm going to start with this guy. I'm going to bring up this guy too. This is kind of interesting. Uh, this is a one-off uh, shot. This is just a one-off. Okay. This is not a. Uh, uh, this is not a uh, uh, photo that's stacked. Yeah. Correct. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This is the Hubble Hubble's variable for. nebula, and this right here is of course the nebula. And what we look at is this nebula has a really interesting coloration here, and we actually see a little bright knot right here. And guess what? That bright knot was not there the last time we imaged the Hubble's variable nebula. So something has changed in this nebula. Something has changed. This, this brightness here is a little dimmer. Uh, and this area is a little bit more bright. Something is changing. And that could be the result of the fact that it's variable. Next time we look at it, it might be looking a little differently. So Hubble's variable nebula is pretty cool, too, showing us some neat uh, differences, you know. Uh, now, uh, in addition, um, we did the Flame Nebula, if you remember last night, and this is what that turned out to be. Okay, you can see the flame, and when we look at it closer, uh, you'll notice that in our flame that we photographed last night, uh, <clears throat> we have a uh, we have a another we have a much more complexity in here. We That's can gorgeous, isn't it pretty? It's gorgeous. We can I see we can see a, a lot of interesting stuff in here, a lot of interesting convolutions and and, and uh, uh, variety in here. And this is the color I was looking for yesterday, but like you said, you couldn't achieve it until you stacked it. Yeah. And so, then, wow. And then once I processed it, you can see the color. This is mm -hmm. this beautiful color. Um, so yeah, this even is, like the purple around. Mean this? Uh, wait, don't tell me. I'm not gonna. Um, you know what that is. On the talk? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> well done. Yeah. So this is an interesting location. It has a lot of stuff going on. Of course, we could zoom in till it's, till it's sickening, you know. But uh, we can see that obviously there's a lot going on in here. You can see there's some bright knots in here. And if we could get better resolution here, we could actually see this almost like a three-dimensional object, almost like a Hubble photo. See how it's bright here and then it's dimmer here? This is a three-dimensional shape of this nebula that we're looking at right here. Just incredible. So there's the, the flame nebula hiding for, uh, for all to see in Orion. Okay. Uh, now, uh, the next one that I want to show you from last night is one that... Uh, I just couldn't wait to see. This is the Christmas tree nebula, a Christmas tree cluster, and the cave nebula at the bottom. And I got both in the frame. Okay. These are incredible. Here's the Christmas tree cluster up here. And then down here, right here, I'm going to zoom in. Okay, right here, I'm going to zoom in. Okay. You'll see this is what's called the, the cave. This is a dark uh, little nebula. Okay, which has is being illuminated, uh, possibly by one of these stars here or that star, uh, and you can actually see this detail very, very nicely uh, here on this image. Um, and this is something I worked at for a while to get that too. You can see some really interesting details in here, and as we move up, you can see this reflection element, this reflection nebula element of the Christmas tree cluster. A dark nebula piece right here and here, and dark lanes within here, and then more emission nebula here. So this becomes emission nebula, all right, where we're getting this hydrogen gas being exciting and it's luminescing. And then we see this reflective element over here from this star and the other stars. Isn't that nice? 
and that's just so pretty. And the cave it down is. this this has been elusive uh, for me a lot, and 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 now it's actually showing up really well. Actually, the only problem is uh, I have to just do this. I want to bring it up because I I'm, I guess it's, I'm hiding some of it, which I didn't realize. Uh, I gotta uh, I gotta change my settings a little bit. Let me just do that real fast. Uh, change my settings. Uh, so bottom line is we can actually see the the cave over here. It looks really pretty. Um, and then uh, moving up, okay, we have the Christmas tree cluster uh, and its associated reflection nebula. So it, it came out really pretty, and I was very happy to see that I got it all. Okay, and so that was pretty. Now, this was all last night. Now, when you want to, I mean, if you want to talk about, like, well, what did it look like to our eyes as we all looked at it? What did we see? Well, what we saw when we looked at this was this. This is what we saw. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't see uh, this other image. We, we didn't see this finished image that I just brought up for you. Okay? We didn't see that. We saw this. We, uh, you know, we saw... This is what the finished image looks like. And you compare it to that other one. You didn't see any of this. You didn't see any of this other nebula. You didn't see any of these really interesting areas here that have dark and uh, dark nebula and emission nebula. You didn't see any of that. We just see this reflection nebula a little bit. And that's it. Isn't that impressive? That's, that's crazy. I so love it. How many pictures did you say would you say were stacked in any one of these photos now? Uh, well, in this particular image, I have, uh, let's see, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, about 22 to 25 photos that I stacked. 25? Maybe, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six times one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> yeah, so uh, actually, uh, I actually stacked over... Uh, well, in the end, it was uh, 40 images wow. for this one. Impressive. It really looks good. It looks amazing. I'm just wondering, like, how many images you really have to, like, and, like, the Flame Nebula, like, to get those colors. Oh, the Flame, from actually. From such a faded. Yeah, you're right. Well, the Flame, and let's just take a quick look at that again. Uh, the Flame Nebula actually consisted of... Um, uh, let's see, we have uh, seven, nine, I'm uh, sorry, uh, eight, eight images. I stacked eight images, which is a pittance. Hardly anything at all, you know. Yeah, but for the color, wow. Yes, to get the well, color. We're looking at basically almost almost black and white pictures. Yeah. There's some color, but. Yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah. Now. Remember I took that photo of the Orion Nebula? Mm -hmm. I took a photo of the Orion Nebula because I want to show uh, at a lower ISO some of the details in the Orion Nebula. Now check this out. Okay, yeah. this is that resulting photo. Okay. And that was really faded. I mean, it was still colorful, but it was really, really like a pastel kind of faded. Yeah. 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 It was sort of like this, right? Okay. But when we actually looked at the final version, this is what we got. And if you notice, okay, we see some really interesting features. Like if we come in and look closer, uh, look at this little area right here. Check that out. There's a little wisp going this way. Okay, this is an area where there's some dark globules probably, dark uh, Bach globules, where uh, we're getting uh, what are called proplids, a little like, protoplanetary or proto solar uh, proto star system actually formation it's a massive area look at this 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 large piece of nebula that's winding down here three dimensionally you get the, the the reflection going here and then down here we actually see it coming all around like I told you it does you know it comes all the way around and it has this billowy look to it you know like we expected it did so the Orion nebula has this tremendous complexity in it and if you look, you can actually see how much, uh, you know, we can see these tiny little stars up here. We see this is this is this little area is called the bay in the Orion Nebula, 
But look at down here. Look how the right here. There's a bright edge that is. Uh, it's an emission area, but there's also dust in there that's reflecting light. And check it out. Uh, it's bright in there, and there's probably a star in there that we cannot see. That's actually causing this to be very, very uh, uh, bright in here. Uh, you know, so not not a bad set of images. Now we have on this side we have uh, this other area where. It's really dark and fairly sharp contrast, but as like I said, just like going to an, into a cloud in an airplane, as you get closer to this, this border will become less sharp and more diffuse, as you, and you'll enter it before you even realize you're entering a border. So it's uh, just a, a gorgeous nebula, and it has a lot to offer, especially when you consider how much uh, complexity it has. And what's really going on in here? This has probably been the most, one of the most studied uh, nebulae uh, on uh, on Earth, frankly. Uh, and you can see why. You can definitely see why. You know, I like this little this little nebula up here. Okay, obviously we're out of the uh, realm of of uh, good focus up there. Um, you you make trade offs with certain types of telescopes. My telescope uh, in this observatory. Uh, is a somewhat of a rich field telescope. It's a, a, a its focal length is 6.3. Usually telescopes are f8, f10, and that means that you're going to see a smaller amount of the field uh, in the end when you start looking through eyepieces or putting them through cameras. Uh, and that reminds me, Martin actually wanted to know um, what what your imaging system was. Oh, uh, the imaging system is a uh, a Sony uh, A7S2 camera. Is it Martin Willis? No, it is Martin. Martin. Uh, Kobolch. Oh, okay. Cool. Sorry, I'm not sure if I'm butchering your last name. I apologize. You can yell at her, Martin, back. for if he if she did. <laughs> I'm Danny Fan One in chat. Take it in on her. <laughs> well, that's very um, cool. We had another question. It's it's a little late to what we were talking about, but it's a great question. Okay. It's from our good friend Daryl. Hi, Daryl. He's still still hanging in with us. He's doing his best to uh, hang in, but uh, if you need to rest, I understand. He's so sweet, so loyal. Um, that we see changes in Hubble Variable Nebula over such short periods of time. What does that tell us about the nebula's size, or what's going around inside or around it? Uh, it gives us an idea of the uh, orbital characteristics of the dark cloud of material that could be circulating around the star in an orbit. Now, uh, when when the planets go around the, the sun, uh, if you can imagine that you could be far outside the solar system, and if they all swung around the sun at the same time so that they would all block the sun enough so that the light from the sun would be substantially dimmed, uh, then every time they orbited, around the sun that would tell us something about how long it takes for the overall uh, orbits to be done now that can't happen obviously because you know the farther away a planet is the slower it moves so they'd never be orbiting together at the same speed otherwise the planets farthest out would have to be moving at an ungodly speed to stay catching up to the innermost ones but that said this is such a beautiful nebula that said um, when we uh, what it tells us is something about the actual uh tells us something about the actual uh, uh cloud and uh, like maybe how far away it is from the star um and that's actually a theory we don't actually know for sure that this is what's happening but we think that there's you know this dark dust that is circulating and orbiting the star kind of like a planet that's not been formed yet uh and it tends to at times block part of the light going away from the star making Hubble's variable nebula vary in brightness. Um, so uh, there's a well-known period for Hubble's variable nebula, which I do not know. Uh, so don't ask. I, I, I will try to figure that out. Uh, but that, that well-known period uh, is such that we could watch it vary if we, uh, if we had the time and the clear skies. We could watch it vary over that time period and take photos of it every time. I think I caught it at a very different brightness level from the last time we caught it. And I think that's 
really uh, kind of neat. I mean, it tickles me no end to see things in the universe change. It really tickles me no end to see that because when I actually see that there are changes going on in the universe, I'm really amazed. I, I, I like seeing that because we're so used to the heavens being immutable. But they aren't. They change. Things happen. And we actually can watch them happen. Very, very cool stuff, you know. I really, really love it. Uh, as you notice, I'm uh, th this is this little nebula that we're playing with right here. Uh, and I'll show you where it is. Okay, this is where it is. And what it, where is it in relation to Orion? Well, here is Orion's belt. Okay. And here is the uh, Casper the Friendly Ghost Nebula that we're looking at right here. Okay. Now, where was this at Halloween? Uh, you looking want, for ghost nebulas. Yeah, good question. Well, at Halloween, Orion wasn't up high enough to be able to see. So um, we're, you know, we're stuck right now, but that's okay. Well, we can use them next year. We can. We can. Do a no whole doubt. new Halloween show. Sure. I have no doubt about it. <laughs> I'll keep my eyes peeled for interesting interesting names. They are small on my screen, though, so I don't know. With what? my bad eyesight. Oh, are they? Well, I could probably... Because you know, who did we see yesterday? If I do this, if I, if, I, if I zoom in, okay, this is getting close to <laughs> it's going right into the nebula but the text stays the same size yeah what did we see yesterday it was something thor's with a really weird name too thor's helmet no okay uh, well i know we saw that but no that's not what i was thinking it was right. something else with a weird name okay a uh, cartoon character maybe and maybe? not gossamer it was someone else and it was labeled huh and you're like if you don't believe me here it is and I couldn't believe it. Was it Felix the Cat? No. No. Well, someone in chat, help her out. Because if you were here... <laughs> They're not going to know. Mm. It was probably only funny mm. to me. But like Casper the Friendly Ghost, that's hilarious. Yeah. When we found that, that stove or the furnace. Yes, Fornax. That, that Fornax the furnace. Oh, my yeah. God. <laughs> See, I'll remember Fornax. I've heard it once, and I remember it. Yeah, you do. And I can't remember things from, you know, 20 streams, but... Yep. But you I remember that. You remember Fortnite. That's funny, yeah. I remember there was a crater on the moon called Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> Again, that that's funny, but I'm sure I'm sure it was a cartoon character, and I can't remember who it was now, and it's going to drive me crazy. I wonder if the... I wonder if the... Uh, I wonder if that cartoon character... I'm sorry, not the cartoon. I wonder if that crater Bruce on the moon is named after... Uh, the uh, Bruce sketch um, for Monty Python. I think that'd be funny. That'd actually be the Never funniest know. part of it. Yeah. You familiar with the Bruce sketch? No. The Bruce sketch, yeah. It's like, hello, I'm Bruce. This is Bruce, and my my, my name's Bruce. And what's your name? And I think he's like Steve. He said, well, mind if we call you Bruce? Keep things straight. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> kind of funny. Uh, the Bruce sketch it was called. I keep going back because I'm I'm catch I'm capturing some imagery here of this Casper the Friendly Ghost nebulae, so that I so may I see it all put together. Yes, because I'm going to put it back together uh, later and and show you the resultant image, which will be very pretty, I'm sure. Yes, indeed. Uh, let's see, where was I going here? I was in here to show you something else. Something about funny names, maybe? Nope. Eh, wrong. It's all right. I'm not even waiting for this to do this. I'm trying to just do a number of them. <clears throat> oh, I know what I was doing. Sorry. Now I get it. What are you going to do? Ah, I'm just trying to get the uh, chat up. I can't see what's going on yet. Oh. That's all. I think they're having a wonderful time. A lot of people are excited for a back-to-back -back stream. A lot of people are impressed that you can do a new two-hour show and then keep on going right into the night. Um, but no, when you have the clear skies, take advantage. And now he doesn't have to go freeze out in that dome. 
So, yeah, and that's that's just that's that's why I end up going for way longer than I say I'm gonna go. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'm taking advantage of of the weather, you know, too, because this is obviously a clear night prospect, you know, doing this kind of thing. So I don't like having to, you know, I don't like having to, to you know, not stream when I want to stream. I can't go up into onto Facebook or anywhere else and say, okay, I'm going to stream tonight and then just always stream tonight because I may not be able to, you know. I may not be able to. So... So anyway, I want to just say hi to the folks out in the chat now. I see we have a few. I want to thank, uh, hey, there's California Dreaming. Uh, I, it was California Dreaming who asked the question. I said it was uh, Dunster. It wasn't. It was California Dreaming okay. that asked about the um, uh, Chang 4. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. Yeah, I, I think Gotta I... give proper credit. Yeah. Yeah. My life has been very complicated lately, and uh, I I take streaming as sort of a uh, method for overcoming my stress. And I'm very thankful that people come to see me there. Uh, and I, I like that uh, people enjoy uh, the streams very much. So I want to say hi to California Dreaming. Uh, you know who you are. I want to say hi to Cosmic Lettuce and Daryl, of course, and ERT Radio. That's Ronald out in Jeffers, Minnesota, postage stamp size town. You can walk around it in 10 minutes. Well, maybe not quite 10 minutes, uh, but it's actually uh, it's actually a, a small little square. Really cool. Say hi to James Dugan down under in Oz in Australia. Justin T. and Laura Hovey. Hello, Laura. Good to see you. Uh, and then Tim F. and Tom J. You guys, you keep us That's all going. Tom Jensen. Yeah, made me Tom that Jensen. I was UFO. about to say that, yeah. And I noticed that uh, I've got a little green here and a little red here. Uh, this indicates to me that I've got a little bit of a problem. And I think I can see it in my dome over here I, I have to come i have to go out and i think i might have to move the dome because maybe the telescope is impinging on the dome right here and so if this is in the way that's going to cause a problem so i'm going to uh run out and do that okay and then we'll get our imagery back because i'm we're getting some strange colors here that are probably related to the fact that we're getting interference with the white uh, uh of the dome so this is, see, this is, Amanda, where you now take over. I know, but can I tell you something before you go? Yeah. Oh, it's really nice. Um, Martin says, and it's Martin No Block. Okay. By the way. Okay. Um, he just wants to let us know that he discovered your show over the summer, and it got him back into astronomy after a 10-year hiatus. Oh, Martin. Thank that's... you for sharing that, Martin. That's really, really nice. That's really, really great news, Martin. Thank that's you sweet. so much. I, I, I'm humbled that you did that. And I'll tell you, you know, that, that, that does my heart good to hear those kinds of stories. Um, I like the fact that, that we can, you know, encourage people um, very much so. Oh, while you're doing whatever you're doing? Yeah. Oh my God! We need a title for tonight's show. You're right. Uh, I just got a message from Bill. Okay, well, think of one while I go move the dome. I'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be okay, right back. Okay, guys. Okay. Chat. Yeah, ask them. Hey, chat. <laughs> yeah, go do what you're doing. Okay. Oh, he's already gone. Um, we need an a title for that last episode. So anyone that was listening to Sky Tour Radio earlier at kgraradio.com. Um, what do you guys think? We talked about, um, the Mars 2020 mission. We talked about, uh, Ultima Thule. We had, uh, Keith from PNK Science. PNK Space Imaging has now gone to PNK Science, just so you guys know. Uh, same channel, uh, same content, same, uh, same contributors, Paul and Keith, but, uh, new name. Because they're going to do more than just space imaging from now on so look forward to that in 2019 and we had bill on our sweet producer bill skywatcher 
definitely check him out on YouTube. You can go to Bill NY Skywatcher. There's also Bill NY Gaming. Sometimes we play Family Feud there. Uh, sometimes he plays video games. Sometimes he cooks. Um, you know, anytime starting in September, you'll see him decorating for Christmas. Yes, I said September. Um, yeah, so we need a title. We need a title. So I'll take suggestions. Okay, what are we naming it? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, so uh I was uh I'm wearing my special hat tonight, which I think you can see here on the camera. <laughs> Cute girl. A two hour tour. <laughs> yeah. So hey out there. Uh yeah. So uh I I really uh I'm very uh grateful for everybody that's uh comes along for this. Because uh, I know that uh, the time you take is precious to you. It's precious to me as well. And uh, I just, I don't know, I guess I have a sickness, um, unfortunately. And that sickness is that I must photograph beautiful sky. And uh, when it's clear, I have to do it. You know, um, tomorrow I order... Um, this material, it's a toothed belt that's going to go all around the inside of the dome. And it's going to allow me to, uh, with this motor that I, I have here, this is a stepper motor. Uh, this stepper motor is going to allow me to, uh, to turn the dome. Uh, and I'm going to write a program so that I can turn the dome and keep it facing uh, the, keep the telescope, or, or sorry, keep the dome facing where the telescope is pointing, so I won't ever have to go back out and handle the dome. And the next step is to then move it to Arizona. That's getting closer and closer. Um, you know, there, there's not much keeping me in uh, the state of Connecticut anymore, and uh, I'm very happy that I'll be able to get out uh, at, at some point. Um, I've got a lot going on, but you know, I think that it'll be wonderful. Of course I have my, uh, my wonderful boys and they're going to go through college and finish college. And then I'm going to, uh, get out of Connecticut, uh, cause the skies are terrible for one thing. There's a lot of other reasons to get out of Connecticut too. Coldness. Uh, yeah, there you go. Yep. There you go. So uh, that certainly is a, a problem, you know. Okay, so now you see we're getting the imagery back, and it looks good. Uh, and uh, I'm I'm doing this to uh, just make sure that everything is up to par here. The telescope here, you can see the telescope that here is pointing directly out of the slit right now. This is the view from the uh, bench, the work table actually inside the dome, uh, and Casper the Friendly Ghost. Nebula looks beautiful. It's sort of soft and has some variegated areas here, which means it has some variation and so forth. Uh, and But a lot of details hidden in there. There's a lot in there that's hidden that you can't really see. And we're going to try and bring that out in the processing later. Um, so we'll do that. And... Uh, it's 11.37 now, which is actually a very auspicious time uh, for someone that I know. Um, 11.37, except it was 11.37 a.m., not p.m., right? Uh, it was a time when a, a friend of mine was uh, born. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I've clicked that, and off we go. <clears throat> And let's see, now we got, uh, uh, let me see if I can, while well, that's taking a picture. Okay, it's done. How about, listen, how about Ultimate Mars and Ultima Thule? Oh, hey, that's not bad. Give me something. Bill's waiting. He can't edit until we have a title. Okay, um... 
Ultima, Ultima Mars. Um, okay. The Ultimate Frontier Mars. Uh, well, I don't know. I like where you, I like where you're going with it. Sort of. I I kind of understand what's going on there. Uh, Ultima, Ultimate Mars and Ultima Thule. That's what I said. Okay. Yeah. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like it better now that you said it? No, I was trying. I'm just. I had to say <laughs> things over. Teasing. I'm just teasing. Don't tease me. I'm kidding. All right, we're back to some Spectre. I just did some Spectre here. So, of... what do you think? Do you like it? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yes, I did. Thank you. Once again, for those just joining us, uh, or those that have been here a bit, maybe you didn't see this yet. This is Orion's belt. All right, and this is the spectrum of those three stars. Okay, on the Taka, on the Lam and Mintaka. But this down here, and I was trying to get the right combo, and I got it now. This down here is another spectrum. And the spectrum is of something that's not quite uh, very obvious. It's actually the, the nebula, the Orion Nebula. And we know that in these nebula, there is uh, emission lines that are being emanated by these nebula. When the, the atoms are made to fluoresce, basically... Uh, by atomic transitions that are happening because the, 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 the light is so powerful that it's ionizing some of these atoms. And look what happens when it comes back in. It comes back in and we see this characteristic red emission line. This is the whole spectrum of the nebula right here. We see this red emission line, which is the hydrogen alpha line. And then we see this line here. Now, that's not a reflection nebula. This is confusing for some. This is actually the oxygen-3 line this is the line of oxygen 3 that is being emitted by the nebula as well so we're seeing the red primarily and then we're seeing some blue orion's nebula the orion nebula is known as an emission reflection nebula there's some areas of the nebula that are uh, uh reflecting dust uh, uh reflecting light off dust and there's some areas of the nebula that are emitting light as well and we can see the two really bright emission lines that are coming out of the orion nebula right there. So this is a, a neat uh, a neat way to see this. And then when we look at the stars themselves, we see that the stars have this spectrum. Okay, and I didn't, I have to focus this again. I had it focused beautifully the other night, but it's, it's uh, the focus is off now. But basically, you can see dark bands that cross across the spectrum here. These are dark lines that are are called absorption lines. All right, and the absorption lines are very uh, much related to what the star is composed of. We're actually seeing what's in the star's outer atmosphere. If you can identify these lines, which always occur at the same place for each particular element, then you can actually see uh, the uh, you can you can identify what's inside this uh, star and what it's made of. Okay, the elements, in fact, that make it up. So it's actually uh, a wonderful. Uh, a wonderful uh, way to do uh, stellar study and so forth. The most important thing is being able to see these emission lines from the Orion Nebula. And if we were looking at a planetary nebula as well, well then we'd see this as well. We might see some of this, but we'd see a lot of this O3 stuff coming off because the planetary nebula is emitting a lot of that. Okay, This is not a planetary nebula, obviously, but I just want to show you that this is actually a very good... Uh, uh, Jesus, sorry, Jesus. Uh, there's a very good uh, teaching moment here with this to see the differences in the spectra. So going back now uh, and checking out our um, our, our view again, um, <clears throat> I've taken quite a few of that uh, nebula. I'll take one more, and then we'll move to something different. And while we're sitting here thinking about what to go to next, let's just bring it up and figure out where we want to go next. And if anyone has any suggestions, uh, feel free to uh, let me know what you want to do, where you want to go. Um, I want to show us a couple of things. Uh, there is this little guy right here, uh, which is uh, the Monkey Head Nebula. And uh, it's really, uh, I don't think it's going to really show too well, uh, but we can try it. Uh, it's got a you know, we got to bring the telescope uh, a lot higher. In fact, if we look at where our 
angle is, what the angle is here for uh, the uh, the lines, the constellation lines are actually the, uh, we're actually looking at, uh, this is a right ascension and declination mark. So it's at plus 20 degrees. Let me just uh, back out a bit so we can see where we are. Okay. Uh, it says it's at plus 20 degrees in declination. Uh, and then we have um, right ascension is are these numbers, and those are in hours and minutes. And there's 24 hours in right ascension, which is east to west movement. And then, of course, there's a declination, which is zero at the equator and plus 90, and then zero at the equator and minus 90 for down below the uh, equator. And so uh, when we watch something like this uh, or see something like this, this is actually uh, very illustrative and helps us, uh, you know, figure out where things are. Uh, and so I want to actually remove those lines, and I want to bring in, say, another set of lines. That's the equatorial grid. I want to do the azimuthal grid here. And uh, this, to get an idea, we're actually, uh, when it comes to being above the horizon, we're about 40 degrees uh, above the horizon right here. Uh, almost 50 actually uh, for this guy so let's I'm not sure if we'll be able to see it but let's see if we can go and check it out and see what's there all right so let's head there now we should come okay, back were you watching chat or I was not why no. oh no we have some requests coming in oh, okay uh, that's wonderful I'd like to hear them I actually forgot to get off the participant list all right here we go yeah. um well, Cosmic Lettuce, I uh, was hoping you could do a quick profile uh, profile plot of the spectra. I don't know if that's what you were just doing or not, if so that's considered the same thing. Actually, that's uh, I have one of my uh, one of my uh, setups here inside this broadcasting software mm -hmm. is actually to show and actually go through an entire spectral analysis using the spectra. Um, and I have a product that actually have to do that. Uh, it's called RSpec uh, by uh, a, a guy that uh, is a, a very good uh, spectral guy. He wrote the program, and I've been talking with Tom back and forth, and he's got a great product, so I've been using it um, quite quite a bit. Um, let's go see how our telescope, by the way, looks here. I want to see what we got here. Uh, I think... No, oh, I think we're going to be okay. I think this might be a nice uh, nice uh, view, or at least a nice attempt at a view. So let's go and take a 20-second image at 32,000. Anyway, just to see what we get here. Uh, first, let me confirm that the telescope has stopped. It has not, so i got to do this. This, uh, this is not an issue at whatsoever. I just wanted to make sure that uh, the telescope doesn't have any other movements that it may choose to do. Sometimes a telescope takes a while to even out, uh, and sometimes it does not, you know. So this time it, it was just, uh, yeah, this time it was just uh, doing whatever it was doing at the last second. I do not know. Ooh, I'm not on mute. <laughs> you can hear me tipping away. Yeah, I can. You're all like, tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick -tick. Okay. This now, is, um, this is well, the monkey head. Just let right me know here. when you're taking requests. Okay. I'm going to just go and uh, go back to my little, uh, my, uh, my uh, uh, live view here for a sec. And I'm going to move us over a bit. So I have to grab my telescope tool and move us westward a little because the monkey head is right here uh, and we're going to bring this over and now we should be able to see it now we'll do 20 seconds at 32,000 here don't ask it where the monkey head is because it doesn't I don't necessarily see it uh, so Cosmic uh, as far as doing a profile I will do that um, I have to first focus the spectra it's kind of cold outside so I thought it was focused but the cold changes the focal uh, values unfortunately and that does make it but harder. Remember that request um, do bring it back next time maybe we can do it on our next stream. Yeah absolutely 
Okay, one thing I'll um, do right now, though, first of all, is I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to do a focus here because apparently it looks like it might be a little off. So I'm going to focus now. Okay, so, oh yeah, see, that's just did better focus. So I'm going to go beyond that and then come back to it. Okay. All right. And now let's take that picture again. And let's see if it looks better. So let's turn off the focus mode and go back to the main mode here. And let's see where we go from here now. Do you guys like the, uh, the, Dome Ops view, where we actually you know, get to see what I'm doing in here. Um, it's not really meant to be some kind of self-serving thing. I just want to make sure that you can see and understand what I'm doing, too, because I think it's important for you to know where I am and what I'm doing. But let me know if you like that view. Uh, and that's this view down here in the corner. Okay, look, this is the monkey, the monkey head. This looks really nice. I'm going to take us over to our, our view all right here and here's the processed view of it uh just it, again this is a one-off all right but it, it's very very interesting and i think that we'll be able to uh take that and uh and, and do more with it than we, uh, than uh, we thought so i'm going to do another 20 second photo i'll take a few of these guys it's uh 10 of 12 and i said it only go to midnight and I got a little smile on my face because I think you know what that means. I never so follow my own rules. <clears throat> How many of you are actually uh, uh, were part of the uh, uh, Sky Tour radio tonight? How many of you came in and listened and were part of the chat? Were you all there or no? Uh, there were quite a few. Let me see. I see the participants. I can see. I know Daryl was. Ronald was. Uh, James Dugan dropped by. Yeah. Um, well, for James, I mean, it's it's middle of the day for him. <laughs> you know? It's amazing. Um, for anyone who, who thinks the Earth is flat, um, talk to someone in Australia. Okay. Yeah, and because the flat earthers, they say, oh, well, the sun's like a spotlight and just goes over the earth, the flat earth. Really? I got so many holes that I I just, can, off the top of my head, blow through this theory. I can't believe that they actually can think this with a straight face, frankly. Raymond was in there. Awesome, yeah. Um, Ian says that he was listening. He wasn't in chat, though. Okay. Uh, just so he knows, next time I know he asked if like the main chat room was for like if they ha if we had specific chat rooms for specific shows, but no, there's one main chat room. Yeah. Okay. And you just hit listen live. Yeah. Ian, you know what? You're, you're right. There are flat earthers down in uh, Oz, but I will tell you this, um, frankly, uh, the the people that are uh, that believe in a flat Earth, I just think are people that. Unfortunately, science has failed them miserably, you know, and I kind of take some of that blame on myself because, you know, for my part, for anyone that has taken something that I've done, taken a class I've taught or whatever, and came out later thinking it was a flat earth, um, you know, the fundamentals of science are very important. And if we give up on people, then that's what turns out is people that have wrong assumptions. Um, my, one of my, one of my professors when I was getting my astronomy degree was very uh, hard with me because he felt that I was, uh, this is beautiful, my gosh. Uh, he felt that I was very, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh -huh. He felt that I had these, he called them preconceived notions. And the problem is he was right on one hand, wrong on another. And what I mean by that is, I had preconceived notions, he's right, about certain things that were able to be conceived. I didn't have preconceived notions about things I didn't understand. I was an open book. 
Uh, so not it wasn't the same kind of thing, you know, for me, unfortunately. Uh, and I think that his uh, his approach was to kind of kind of label me as having preconceived notions, which was kind of funny. Um, when I went back to him a few years ago, actually, I went over to see say hi to him at the university uh, where I got my degree, and uh, he uh, he said, "Look, I took a UFO photo, and I want to show you." Now he had he had seen me on a, a couple of the UFO shows because I I do. You know, a lot of the NASA's unexplained files. I do what on earth? I'm on the late, the new in search of now, and um, and I get inquiries for others. You know, but uh, I can't do everything. Well, uh, he he showed me this photo that he took, and by gosh, it did look like a UFO. And what it turned out to be, I could see what he had done, and I I let him, I let it ride for a bit. Uh, and he was like, so you you see the UFO? I go, yeah, I do, Bill. I do indeed see the UFO, uh, but I can't tell what kind of leaf it is. And he looked at me like, like, like he was dejected. And I said, I can see that you took a photo of something on the hood of your car and that the photo looks very much like the sky and something in the sky and then you just flipped it upside down so we'd see the sky and the and the ground in the right orientation and he's like oh man i go that's why i'm a photo analyst bill i figured this stuff out <laughs> he's like well he goes yeah you got me and i go well i wasn't trying to get you i think that uh it, it was just kind of fun you know I'm, i never shrink from one of those challenges those are fun for me so anyway, uh, that was kind of fun, um, and so uh, you know he. Uh, I have never talked to with any of my uh, academic colleagues about uh, the flat Earth garbage because they won't even tolerate the discussion. And you know, I don't know why I do. Uh, I think perhaps because I feel like maybe there's still a chance that I can help people figure this thing out and see that there's no such thing as this flat Earth nonsense. But you know what? I don't know. We will see. Um, but, uh, and thank you for bearing with me as I keep taking picture after picture after picture of the monkey head. Uh, again, you're seeing the raw views, uh, and it's going to become uh, pretty obvious that, uh, uh, pretty obvious that uh, this is going to become something a lot prettier. Just like the, uh, the, uh, the, the Christmas tree cluster in the cave nebula. <clears throat> when I showed you those, those were actually very pretty. Um, and I saw, in looking at these raw images here, okay, I can see what lies within, okay? And I see that, like, like for instance, this one here, we've got uh, uh, guiding errors, not guiding errors, but uh, probably wind-related issues. So uh, what I do is I take a lot of pictures and I weed out every single one of the pictures that's even slightly distorted, even if it means I only have a couple uh, that are left to use, uh, and then I will come back and uh, I'll come back and uh, just, just stack those. But I can always take these pictures and then take more pictures on another night because um, I I understand how stacking works. I get it. I know that you and this is this is a better picture. I understand that you want to make sure that when you stack images that they're all at the same. Uh, time all the same temperature uh same duration all that well guess what i've taken photos that are not uh, at the same time not the same temperature and at different exposure settings okay and i've managed to get some good results and the reason is because i was able to get rid of the stuff that the differences in the photos would otherwise uh, include um, and that's stuff like this noise that we see here you're watching the noise melt away here as this noise uh, uh, process uh, carries on here and it's really cool to, to be able to do that uh, and I got a lot of uh, a lot of these uh, up my sleeve I got a lot of these little tricks up my sleeve you know so I'm pretty uh uh, pretty pleased that we can do this. Um, so, did you, uh, Amanda? Did you have something that you wanted to mention earlier? 
Um, everyone in chat is in consensus. They want to see Uranus. Okay. If we can. Apparently Uranus and Neptune are both up. Uh, yeah, uh, it might necessitate a trip out to the dome. <laughs> oh. That's oh. okay. I don't mind. I don't mind. You guys, uh, you are you are the driving force. I'm certainly not going to say no. I have no problem with that. All right. Um, now, I might... Well, you know what? Here's what we'll do. Let me, first of all, let's go find out where Uranus is right now. And we'll search for it, find out where it is. Are you seriously typing in search in Greek? Yeah, well, see, look, there's Uranus. It's, it's way down uh, on the horizon. See that? Oh. That might not be might not be a good view. I might. I don't even know if I have that horizon here. I I might, but uh, and I think Neptune's actually higher in the sky. Uh, well first, I got to get into the uh, the box. Okay. All right. So now, if we look at Neptune, uh, Neptune. Yeah. Okay. That might have been the, for this nebula. Um, I don't think it got it right for the planet. Well, uh, that's unfortunate. Let me do it again. Uh, I know there's there's other uh, other ways to get at this. Yeah, Neptune is what I wanted, and uh, apparently it's set. Uh, and Uranus is way down near the horizon. So I'm sorry about the consensus, fo consensus folks, but uh, it's not going to be too visible, unfortunately. No. Sorry, guys, I tried. Yeah, and uh, I wish we had tried sooner. This might have been a cool thing to do. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to do my best. Oh, yeah, that's... Uh, and for those that missed the Orion Nebula from before, uh, the, this this here is, uh, let's see if I can get it up. This is the Orion Nebula we took the other night. Uh, really pretty with all the details in here. You can actually see some really, look at this really subtle reflection here. Uh, and then we see this blue, this the Oxygen 3 here, that's, that's the mission here, going along with the hi Hydrogen Alpha. When we did that spectra, that's what we're seeing here. The Reflection Nebula is stuff that's out here. Okay, but this is really the, the most powerful emission going on right now. Just amazing. Just amazing. So, uh, that said... Is Pluto around? Uh, I don't know if Pluto is up. <laughs> They're trying. They no, that's, that's, I, I think that's fine. I think that's a great thing. It's, it's awesome. I want to see people, uh, you know you know, see uh, people do the things they want or see the things they want. Mm -hmm. Let's get over to here again now. Okay, and let's uh, turn off the focusing view, which seems to go on whenever it wants to. I don't know why. Uh, okay, so my telescope views are up, and let me just get this going and bring up my broadcasting system. All right, so uh, one more shot here of this nebula, and then we're going to go try looking for other things. Uh, can you read that question to me that just passed by, Amanda, about the circular artifact on uh, the nebula? On. What is the circle on that nebula? Is that a gas cloud that we can't see? Are we talking about the the monkey head? This one right here. We're talking about this part, right here. Possibly, Vicky. Let us know. Yeah, let us. Was know. it on the monkey head nebula? Well, Probably, we... if that's the last one we were looking at. They're lagging a bit. What's the lag right now? Is it like thirty seconds or is it like ten seconds? Probably closer to thirty. Okay.
Oh yeah, cosmic. I can talk about that. Uh, yeah. While I'm waiting here, back from Vicky. Um, the close up just two seconds ago. Uh, this? Or are you talking about the Orion Nebula? <laughs> ay, ay, ay. I'm not sure. Um, I do not know the answer to this question. Um, I'm not sure what you were talking about. Uh, let me answer Cosmics first because that one I can answer because I know what he's talking about there. Uh, what he or she is talking about. I'm not sure if it's a he or a she. Just so you know. Yes? And she said it looked like a bat. Oh, was she talking about the... I wonder if she was talking about that little subtle area in the Orion Nebula that I was pointing at before. You know, the, in other words, uh, were you talking about this area right here that I was pointing to? Which is right here. Look at the look at the reflectivity. There. This you can totally see this three dimensional nature of this very complicated cloud. Is this what you're talking about? Because that's actually part of the subtle reflection nebula that's in here, um, and the oxygen, uh, the the uh, oxygen three, or that's the doubly ionized oxygen uh, that we see, is actually up here causing a lot of this glow here that we're seeing. Yeah. Okay, yes, the Orion Nebula. Okay, yeah. This uh, this overall um is part of the Orion complex. Okay. It's actually uh called the OMCC, the Orion Molecular Cloud Complex. This is sort of like a think of this as a uh um as a uh this is the, this is the one I want. Think of this as a, a uh, dark nebula on which this blister of material is blowing out from the side, so to speak. Okay, We have four hot stars in here, the trapezium, and they are illuminating and causing the glow that we see in the oxygen uh, three here, known as the forbidden line of oxygen. And then we have this red glow here, that's caused by hydrogen gas that is being ionized by the very hot uh, ultraviolet power of these stars. And then when the electrons recombine, uh, they, they, uh, they give off some uh, light, which is red. Thank you, Daryl, for coming along. I'm please glad feel you could, better. Yeah, please feel better. Aww. So this is the O3 area, and this is the hydrogen uh, emission and the, so this is uh, a very complex nebula because it has dark nebula in here this is dust that's obscuring the background all right if it was all if it was gas it wouldn't be visible you see so it's a dark dust in here there's a lot of dust in the interstellar medium uh, very small micron sized particles really uh, interesting and then uh, we have we have, uh, with the Orion Nebula, we have these additional complexities of these very subtle areas. Uh, and you can see just how much they're moving. This is all in motion, by the way. It's just that the motion is across light years. This is about 30 light years from here to here. And it's 1,300 light years to it. And this is 30 light years across. So that's actually you know, quite an uh, uh, amazing area. I don't think we could survive going through there. And, and the reason for that, of course, is because of the strong ultraviolet radiation. We'd have to have a lot of shielding to get through this. Just incredible. Uh, so that's the Orion Nebula uh, there. And now what I'll do is I want to bring us back to um, bring us back to our a uh, wonderful view that I like so much, this one, okay, which shows almost nothing here, but if I just take another photo, 
this will be the last photo uh, for this particular object. Um, Did you tell lettuce? Uh... Cosmic lettuce. I didn't actually. I told him I was going to finish answering his question. I don't think I ever did. I think he did. Um, you think I did or didn't? Did I I didn't think he did. No. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, talk okay. about the difference between uh, ten stacked twenty second exposures and a single two hundred second exposure. Yeah. The, the the thing is, when you take a single two hundred second exposure. You're getting everything. You're getting a lot of the noise associated with the image. You're getting uh, 200 seconds of data, all right. But you're also you're also uh, getting um, the uh, additional noise. So let's just look at it from that point of view first. Um, when we take any photo with a digital camera, we get noise. What is noise? Well, this is a photo that can show us that. This is noise. This, these little weird modeling we see here, this is noise. Okay? Turns out this photo is not as good as I thought. Um, and so to get rid of that noise, um, we have to uh, do the following. We have to take many photographs of the object. And then if we stack them, um, we can also do something else, and that is uh, apply different types of uh, what are called dark frames. So, like, you see how it's black back here, right? Well, dark frames are uh, frames that get rid of the noise uh, that the camera produces. For instance, you see this rainbowy stuff? This is noise before it's being eliminated. Now it's gone, all right? And this, these, this noise is characteristic of the sensor of the camera. So what happens is, if you take... One photo for 200 seconds, you're going to get 200 seconds worth of this noise plus your stars and your nebula. But if you take 20 10-second shots, I mean, 10 seconds, you still need time to capture stuff. All right, so they don't compare directly, okay, because you still need time to capture stuff. So um, let's go to this point. Let's say, how does a stacked image differ from another image, a similar image that's been exposed for the same kinds of time for the to get the same types of detail. The way it differs is uh, specifically one case is this noise. Um, if you want to get rid of this noise, what you do is you take a lot of photos for the long duration, and then by stacking them together, what happens is a, a pattern is built within the computer, within the stacking software that takes a look at all the noise associated with the camera and it builds a uh, uh, what's called a master dark frame from all the dark frames. What's a dark frame? Well, you take all these pictures, say 10 shots, say 20 or 30 shots actually of the nebula. Then you take 40 or 50 shots with the cover on the camera, on the telescope. So it's just black. Well, you think, well, well that's stupid. Why do that? Well, because even in the blackness, you're going to get this noise pattern here that's generated by the camera sensor. And you take that, and if you then add the dark frames into a picture that has 10 of these, say, then what you're going to get is you're going to be able to see uh, that you'll have a bunch of frames, all right? And you'll also have the noise, all right? But then... Because you're taking all these images of the dark frames, you get a, a, a good rendering of what that noise looks like, and you can get it, you can remove it from the final image. So it allows you, stacking allows you to increase, for faint objects, you increase the signal to the noise uh, that is typically in an astrophoto. And that's what a stacking's benefit is. All right. But you, you can't just say that uh, one 200 second exposure is the same as 10, 20 second exposure. That's not true. Um, there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, and mostly uh, the fact is that you can't have, um, you, you can't have a single 200 second exposure that shows you a certain amount of the nebula uh, be rivaled by a 20 second exposure of the same nebula. It's not going to show the same data. You have to just figure out, you have to do 200 second exposures. So if you do 10 200-second exposures and one 200-second exposure, 
then you'll get better signal to the noise uh, for that one photo. That's the apples to apples shot there, okay? Uh, more approximately than the other uh, the other analogy. Make sense? I hope Very it does. Cool. I hope it I makes hope sense. It does too. You know, okay, let's see here now. Uh, let's see where else we can go. Oh, and, oh, and I probably just lost it too. Oh, I had it highlighted and I think I just lost it. I think I just clicked off on it. Um, Vicky was saying it was to the left of the trapezium. It was the circle. Oh, okay. So let's go. I want to see what that was about. To uh, the left of the trapezium is almost a complete circle. Okay, let's see. Left the trapezium is almost a complete circle. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's go figure that out. So we go here and to the left of the trapezium, which is here, is almost a complete circle. Do you see a complete circle? I don't know. Where is a complete circle? These are stars. I don't know. Obviously, that I'm not. I'm sure that's not. Can one. you zoom out a little? Zoom out? Yeah. Yeah. It's to the left. This is the trapezium, and this is the left. Hmm. Uh, big circle. I Not necessarily big. I don't think she said big. Actually. Just a circle. I don't know. She said big and then circle. Oh. Talk about is she talking about this? Because this is part of the wing. I mean this. This is look as good as this is. It's not really good enough, is it? There's there's not a. It's not easy to to figure out what someone's saying specifically. Mm -hmm. Ah, but she said yes. Okay, this here. This is actually the region of influence uh, for these stars. Now, the other thing is um, this, th what's missing here in your mental picture that you can't tell, actually, is that this is backed up against a large dark nebula complex. A lot of dark dust in here. So this is like a blister sticking out. And so hot young stars are blowing out with very copious stellar wind, causing this area to kind of clear of the of the gas and other materials so it does clear an area and it, of course it illuminates and causes these to glow and, and also reflect in some cases like down here all right but this is a a large area that's just like we talked about it's a it is round actually see this here this is the rest of it it almost re, it almost completes a circle of vicky and that's kind of the thing that's uh I think you're referring to, uh, but again, it's it's related to the fact that uh, these hot young stars, along with other stars in this nebula, are blowing with a lot of stellar wind. And when it goes up against real dust particles, it can't blow those away as efficiently as it can push atoms of gas away. So they don't go as quickly. They do go, but they don't go as quickly. So it this could stay kind of bunched up for you know. You know, several hundreds of thousands of years uh, before it makes a change. Uh, yes, it, it's basically cleared in a sense, but this is, again, a three-dimensional complex. So between us and this space, there's going to be a lot of gas in here, between us and here, uh, If as we approach the nebula. this Think of everything in the universe as three-dimensional. So if this is like a room... It's going to be a semi-cleared room, but it has all kinds of stuff in it. You know, we can see that, like right here. Okay, we can see that there's all kinds of stuff in here. Very, very subtle motions and other things. Lots of dark nebulae in here. Uh, very subtle. This is a very hot location. Uh, and it's a very uh, energetic stars are, are causing the excitation of these atoms to glow like they do. And that excitation would certainly kill us it's got a lot of power all right so maureen wants to know if there's a monkey's paw by the monkey's head <laughs> um 
actually no uh, and we can just go check it out so people can see this is the monkey's head right here all right and uh, there is no monkey's paw um, we have uh, Do we have a monkey's tail mm, no okay so it's just a monkey's head there is no rest of the yeah, this isn't the constellation. The yeah, this isn't the constellation. This is just this. Just yeah. Yeah. But so uh, I am gonna uh, uh, call the stream tonight. This is wonderful. I'm tired. Oh. I know. I okay. Can't... Okay. Yeah, it has been a long night. We I did, did go to twelve thirty. <laughs> Other well, I know Laura wanted to know if there was such thing as an eagle nebula, but it's already set. But there is an Eagle Nebula. Oh, yeah, yeah, there is. That's M16. Uh, and that's yeah. a beautiful uh, nebula. Actually, <laughs> as before, let me see if I can show that to you. Um, and I'll because make that. Chris, Chris yeah? was hoping to see the Owl Nebula, and James wanted to see the Pinwheel Cluster. You mean the Pinwheel, the pinwheel Galaxy? Probably. Yeah, that'll necessitate dome movement for both of yeah. those. But I, I, I know that... Okay, uh, so the eagle it is. <laughs> well, no, I mean, but but let me explain what I mean by that. I mean, I am I think that uh, there's a lot of really cool imagery that we've taken in the past. Uh, and I'd like to actually... Uh, I'd like to see if I can show you some of those. Uh, now that I have it set up in a way that I can... Uh, so let me just look for the proper proper uh, directory and get us there because oh, cause this is really cool. Let me uh, just give me a moment here, guys. I'm trying to find the location for you to see this. Yeah, how about this? Go down. Can look. There we go. Okay, so it's in here. All right. All right. Okay, so these uh, images, which you're about to see, okay, okay these are uh, like the Sky Tour's best, okay? This is the Heart Nebula, all right, that we photographed uh, last year. Um, and then this is the Horsehead Nebula, that we also photographed last year. That was cool. It looks pretty, yeah. Uh, this is a wide-angle view of the Lagoon Nebula, okay, with a satellite. Uh, and the, the Trifid Nebula is over here, uh, which is really kind of interesting. Uh, and then this is another view of the Orion Nebula from last year that we took. Uh, it looks really nice. Um, and uh, you can see that tonight's Orion Nebula was much better because the subtle, uh, the subtlety in this part of the nebula is lost here, but in that other shot, you can actually see very clearly what's going on here. It's really, really well defined. Um, and this is the, uh, Pac-Man, uh, nebula. You can see it, waka, 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 with the eye, you know. Uh, Pac-Man and the Trifid Nebula. Astronomers have great senses of humor. <laughs> well, some we got Pac-Man, we got Casper. There was another one, and it's going to kill me. <clears throat> yeah. And this is the Bubble Nebula. And this is interesting. The that bubble, really the, cool. The Bubble Nebula is an expanding shell from a very, very hot star in the middle, which I believe is a Wolf Red star. Daryl had to go over. He would love this. And uh, it really is expelling its the outer shell, and it, this is this this seam right here is where it's impacting the interstellar medium. Really incredible. And then uh, this is the um, crescent nebula. The crescent nebula. It has an interesting look too. This is also the result of the Wolf Rayet star with an expanding shell outside. And uh, we'll talk about Wolf Rayet stars now. Actually, that was going to be part of tonight's Sky Tour radio topic, but we didn't get to it. Uh, and we'll talk about comets. Here is the Hubble's Variable Nebula. 
taken last year, and you can see that there's actually a difference in how it looks from uh, tonight. Tonight we saw some extra detail out here, and I don't have a side-by-side -side comparison handy at the moment. Um, this guy here is uh, just a cluster of stars. Okay, it's the Eagle Nebula, but it's actually um, you, it's it's you can't really tell it's the Eagle when you close in. You can actually see little bits to indicate it's the Eagle. Okay, but this is not all there is for the Eagle. I can tell you that. I mean, when we um, as you'll see, when I back out of here, uh, we're gonna see that we're looking at uh, we're gonna see a, a, another okay. Okay, there's the Dumbbell Nebula. This is beautiful. The Dumbbell is a stunning planetary nebula. You can see the central star here. This is a really uh, dim star. It's actually a white dwarf star here. But it's so hot, it literally is causing all of this oxygen here to glow. And this is oxygen-3. That is doubly ionized oxygen. The same line would show up in this as does in the Orion Nebula. Okay, not for the same reasons, but there it would be. And we see a little hydrogen alpha out here, which is really cool. So you see what's going on here is the uh, same types of processes. This is the ring nebula. Again, same thing. We're going to see emission lines here too. Uh, and, and planetary nebulae, that is the remnants of dying stars, okay, will we'll show us that. There's a tiny little white dwarf in there as well. Okay, and now... Um, this is, uh, I believe, this is M76. All right, this is M76, and this is uh, interesting. Here's the Crab Nebula taken last year. This is the Veil, beautiful, and this is where Gossamer comes in again as a as a uh, a description. Um, so we we took this Gossamer uh, view, and you can see again, you can see. Uh, different materials in the nebula. Uh, this is hydrogen alpha and more oxygen three. All right, very common. This is an interesting part. This is the Western Veil. This has a really cool spindly look to the structure, and it's really, really uh, looks so uh, delicate, really pretty. Uh, this was Devil's Tower out in Wyoming. Uh, I stopped and took a photo. Looking at the sky, you can see the Milky Way going down behind Devil's Tower in Wyoming. This was uh, last year. Here's an Andromeda Galaxy photo that we took with the 10-inch telescope, the main instrument. This is a galaxy photo just using the camera looking straight up. Here is the North America Nebula. It's not the North American, it's the North America Nebula. When this is Deneb and it's just north of Deneb. Okay, this is a beautiful globular cluster. This is Mesher 13 in Hercules. It's a uh, beautiful cluster of several uh, tens of thousands of stars. Um, and it's tens of thousands of light years away. Um, this is the Mesher 33 in Triangulum uh, Galaxy. Whoops, sorry. And uh, Mesher 33 in Triangulum is known for its massive star formation regions. This is one right here. Here's another one over here. You can see they're reddish. Okay, there's some here, there's some out here, there's another one out here, and you can see knots of them all throughout the arms. These are areas like this like this little tiny area of, of knottiness right here. This could be their Orion Nebula over here. This could be a massive object the size of the Tarantula Nebula in the Magellanic Cloud. Uh, so a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, and uh, I and and I'm only showing pictures from last year uh, before I close up tonight. This is I the, just said that. Oh, you did. <laughs> That's so weird. I oh. just put that in chat. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. This is the no Sunflower problem. Galaxy. Um, and this is the double cluster in Perseus. I like this image because you can see these two beautiful little uh, stars here, the red ones. They're they're, they're here and here. Um. And these aren't blue normally. These are actually more whitish, and I just did this to accentuate the colors. Okay. Now, here is the eagle. This is the eagle we took one night when it was exceptional here. Look at this. 
this is beautiful. These are all these are what are called the pillars of creation. This is the famous Hubble photo that took the you know that were that uh, it was well, subject of a famous Hubble photo, the pillars of creation. You know, we sometimes get spectacular nights, I and mean, if you zoom in, you can actually see little tiny spindles of gas sticking up off the tallest member here. You can see proplids here. These are these dark areas where deep within there is possibly contracting uh, a material that's going to form solar systems eventually. And this is just a, a wonderful photo. I'm just unbelievably happy with how this one came out. Uh, and it was so stunning. And, but this is the Eagle Nebula. Uh, and all this because uh, Laura wanted to see the Eagle uh, or knew if there was something called the Eagle. And this is the Gamma Cygni complex. This is uh, Gamma Cygni uh, is the star in the center of the Northern Cross. And then there's a nebula complex that's visible here with a dark band of uh, material running through it. Okay, here's the Lagoon Nebula with its associated uh, dark nebulae and hydrogen 2 region. It's being illuminated by an O star right here. So O stars are very powerful. Um, and now here is the wide angle view of the Andromeda Galaxy that we took here with SkyTour Livestream. Uh, we used the 5 inch refractor for this one. You can see a tremendous amount of detail. You can see the entire galaxy and you can see the companion galaxies M32 and M110 that are companion galaxies to Measure 31, the Andromeda Galaxy. You know, really, really pretty. Um, I know I'm going through them fast, but uh, you can go back to the stream and freeze and check them out. This is M33 again, and I circled uh, the uh, largest region in uh, M33 that's a star-forming region. Here's the Pleiades with this beautiful combed uh, reflection nebula that we see here. Uh, and uh, this is just a really pretty. This is one that I, I reworked from the original uh, stuff that we did. And this is another one um, that really is pretty, but I actually reworked that too. This is in the Pleiades as well. This is what's called the Merope, uh, I'm sorry, the Maya, uh, ne the Maya, yeah, Maya Nebula. Uh, and this is actually uh, a little feature. Again, the Pleiades were formed elsewhere and then are migrating through this dust as they move around the galaxy. This is the uh, North America Nebula. This is a close-up. I think that if you look at the, uh, let me see if this next one, this is this is the North American Nebula as a whole. And then this little area right here is where we're focusing on this guy right here. Check out the detail. This is, again, an exceptional night. And you can see that we actually can see a lot of this detail in here and a lot of the glows and and so forth that are 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 here we see a lot of the dark nebula here uh, and this stuff is uh, not reflecting anything so it's not a reflection nebula but we see these really subtle details in this area of the north american nebula this is actually in the gulf of mexico section and it's just I, when i saw this i was stunned i thought it was beautiful Okay, and this is, of course, the Sky Terra Livestream Observatory. And there's the Omega Nebula, okay, M17, and the observatory again. I don't know why that popped up again. Uh, this is M17, uh, just north of the M16. And here's the rosette uh, that we see. This is actually to the left of Orion and uh, in Manaceros, the unicorn. And you can see some very subtle dark lanes in here. Uh, this, these were all, every photograph we see here are under 30 seconds, all right, under 30 seconds. I just took a lot of them and stacked them all, and this is what you get. This shows you the difference, actually. Uh, I remember some of these pictures were fewer requests from you guys, so do hold on to your requests, because it's a brand new year, and that's right. I mean, I don't remember ever seeing Casper before. So I can't wait to see how that no. comes out stacked. Yeah, that'll look pretty. This is uh, the Western Veil, vale, um, or Western Veil, vale, right? Western Veil. Vale, uh, uh, yes, uh, this is I the uh, this is the Eastern Veil. Vale, sorry. Um, Eastern. Huh? Eastern. Yeah, this is Eastern. 
This is the Eastern Veil. Um, the other one, the spindly one, was the Western Veil. And this is from the 5-inch refractor. Uh, and there we go. That's the that's some of the highlights of our uh, amazing Sky Tour live stream for this past year. Um, I want to thank you guys for joining me, for being part of it. Uh, I really appreciate that you come along and hang out with me and Amanda for the time that you do. And I've had a great time. And although uh, today was sort of a very busy day, you know, I do want to thank you for coming. You can see now down in the dome ops, um, we only have the light of the screens right now because uh, my overhead lights are, are Wi-Fi and they're tied into the, a timer. So I don't... Uh, they're not actually uh, on right now, so they, they shut off automatically. Um, kind of funny. Uh, so let's, uh, I'm going to just do this here. And now I'm doing a few things for myself just to pop us over here. See what I get. All right, I'm just taking a few more of the same object. I'm noticing the sky is still good, but I do have to can it. I've got to stop the stream for now. But... I hope you guys had a good time, and I will definitely uh, catch up with you, and I will be uploading these and the other photos from the other day uh, to show you guys uh, how it came out. So, and I will get that link in Facebook for you guys again. It's a companion site for this uh, Sky Tour live stream, live stream yeah. and all those stacked pictures, you can see them all when he gets done with them on Facebook for those of you interested. And on Facebook. Yep. And I will uh, be back on the next clear night, most likely. Um, but um, I want to thank you again for coming along. So have a good night, all of you. And I will be talking to you again. I've got to go out in the cold and shut this all down. Got to go back in this cold dome. Uh, but I will talk to you very soon. And uh, have a good evening, all. Okay. So remember, keep looking up. See you later. Except while you're driving. Exactly. Good night, all.